to encounter. God wants to have a productive relationship with us where he is going to bless us with his manifest presence as well as to take care of our needs. This is a really important thing for us to understand and that we can't just leave our faith just at being saved by Jesus, but then to also then engage with him to have a productive relationship. And so the Bible is not just about to teach us how to get uh, to heaven and then how to live morally here on the earth, but it is also to have a current and thriving relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And that can happen and that is supposed to happen and God wants that to happen. In fact, as we talked about last week, it is why you were created is to be in relationship with God. And so as we approach the Christian faith, what we want to do is we need to engage with God if we want to encounter him. Because we know where God is, he is at work and he is doing certain things within his will. And when we find his will, we need to engage with that if we're going to encounter him. We will not encounter him if we are doing things that are contrary to his will. So this is why it's important when we're leading people that everybody has access to the Holy Spirit, everybody has access to God, regardless of how much scripture you know, regardless of your standing in life, whether you're a pastor or not. Some people think that, you know, pastors have a hotline to heaven. Uh, no, we don't. We've learned how to pray the same way as everybody else. There is no priestly class and then the regular folks. We're all regular folks whom God loves and wants to have a relationship with. And so this is important to know that if we're going to see God in our daily lives, we need to engage with him uh, so that we can know how to recognize him and enjoy his presence and the blessings that he gives. Now, I'm talking a bit of some of the blessings today of what it will be, of how God takes care of us, but I always like to put this caveat in there because we live in such a uh, material society that we don't follow God to get the blessings. We follow God because we love him and want to be with him, and the blessings are just icing on the cake. Uh, we shouldn't be going after God for what he has. That's like trying to choose friends with by how much money they have in the bank, that's not a good moral way to go about it. But if you certainly so happen to make a friend and then they bless you with the means that they have, then that's just uh, an extra bonus. And, but there is blessings that God is going to give us here on the earth. But to give a quick illustration about uh, how God, we need to engage with him in order to encounter him, I'm gonna give you an example out of Jesus' first miracle. Consider this, Jesus' first miracle is recorded in the book of John, is where he is at a wedding party, those things would last up to a week even, and uh, the only sanitary drink to drink is wine, because everything else goes bad, and they had run out of wine at this wedding feast. And Jesus' mother says, hey, what you gonna do about it? And he tries to put her aside, but then ends up saying, all right, you know what? Go get the stone jars that are used for ceremonial washing. So what they would do is they'd have these big stone jars uh, that, are, that are quite tall, actually. They would fill them with water, and as guests would come into the eating areas, they would dip their hands in and wash them. So you can imagine that these are not the cleanest vessels according to our standards today. And so they filled them up with water, and then Jesus said, here, now go and take this to the master of ceremonies. This is basically the master of the party. And uh, as one of their disciples did, he gave it to him, and then the, the master was like, wow, this is incredible. This is the best wine I've ever had. You know, most people usually put out the good wine in the beginning to impress the guests, but then after the week drags on, they bring out the lesser quality stuff. Um, but you've saved the best until now. That was his exclamation to that. Now, it is an interesting story about Jesus redeeming people, because that would have been seen as a huge embarrassment to not provide for your guests. Um, but the, the real interesting thing I find is, is everybody, a couple things, everybody at that wedding experienced a miracle, but most of them didn't know that it was a miracle. They just were blessed by it. So first point in that is that you can be experiencing miracles and not even know it. Who knew that it was a miracle? Those who were engaged with Jesus. And they were also the lowliest standing persons there. They were the servants. And yet, because the servants who had the lowest position there were actually the ones who were engaged with Jesus, knew that it was a miracle. In fact, they had to have such confidence in Jesus and who he already was. Think about this. This was his first miracle. They hadn't seen him do another, a miracle before. So think of the faith of the guy, that, or the gal, I don't know who it was, who took the cup to the master. Think about that for a second. You're going to go give dirty hand water to a master? who would have been a magistrate, who would have had authority to do very bad things to you? Uh, man, the faith of the servant who carried that cup would have been incredible. I can imagine if I watched Jesus do a few different miracles that, okay, he's got this, but he hadn't done one yet. This is the first one. And he turned the water into wine. And the only ones that knew it were those who were engaged. So this is a wonderful example to show that there can be, that God is at work in and around you. You are experiencing his goodness. 
already, there's wonderful things in this life that you are already enjoying um, simply because he has provided them for you, but yet we may not know that they're there. This is really important for us to know. It's even the same as talking about angels, you know, and being hospitable to strangers. We're taught in the Bible that uh, some of us have actually entertained angels without us even knowing that it was angels. Now, we're not supposed to encounter uh, or engage with angels. They encounter with us as God so uh, dispatches. We engage with him. So I want this to be an encouragement to you that to be able to recognize and to see what it is that we can do to engage with God so that we can encounter him and recognize the blessings he's already put in place and to see what more there might be. And just a couple more scriptures that we'll put up here on the screen so that you can do some of your own research too to see how when we engage with God, it ends up being an encounter. We can think of 2 Chronicles 7.14. We can think of John 14, verse 23 to 26, moving onward. And today we're going to be reading the main text is going to be the entire chapter, 14 verses of Isaiah 58. And this is what uh, people had a misunderstanding of what they thought uh, God would do in their lives. And they were wondering why God was not providing for them. This is kind of the history behind it. And they were wondering why that God wasn't uh, paying them the attention they thought that they should. And then God sends his prophet Isaiah to bring the word of the Lord to let them know what they were doing that was wrong. And so why don't we read all of chapter 58 right now, and then we will uh, kind of go through it and see what can we do to engage with God to make sure that we are on the right path. Shout out and don't hold back. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. Announce to my people their rebellion, to the house of Jacob their sins. Yet day after day they seek me and delight to know my ways, as if they were a nation that practiced righteousness and did not forsake the ordinances of their God. They ask of me righteous judgments. They delight to draw near to God. Why do we fast, but you do not see? Why humble ourselves, but you do not notice? Look, you serve your own interest on your fast day, and you oppress all your workers. Look, you fast only to quarrel and to fight and to strike with wicked fists. Such fasting as you do today will not make your voice heard on high. Is such the fast that I chose, a day to humble oneself? Is one to bow down his head like a bulrush and to lie in sackcloth and ashes? Will you call this a fast, a day acceptable to the Lord? Is this not the fast that I have chosen, to loose the bonds of injustice, to undo the thongs of the yoke, and to let the oppressed go free, and to break every yoke? Is it not to share your bread with the hungry, and to bring the homeless poor into your house? When you see the naked, to cover them, and not to hide from your own kin? Then your light shall break forth like the dawn, and your healing shall spring up quickly. Your vindicator shall go before you, the glory of the Lord shall be your rear guard. Then you will call, and the Lord will answer." You shall cry for help, and he will say, Here I am. If you remove the yoke from amongst you, and the pointing of the finger, and the speaking of evil, if you offer your food to the hungry, and satisfy the needs of the afflicted, then your light will shine in the darkness, and your gloom will be like the noonday. The Lord will guide you continually, and satisfy your needs in parched places, and make your bones strong, and you shall be like a watered garden, like a spring of water whose waters never fail. Your ancient ruins shall be rebuilt, you shall rise up the foundations of many generations. You shall be called the repairer of the breach, the restorer of streets to live in. If you refrain from trampling on the Sabbath, from pursuing your own interests on my holy day, if you call the Sabbath a delight and the holy day of the Lord honorable, if you honor it, not going your own ways, serving your own interests or pursuing your own affairs, then you shall take delight in the Lord and I will make you ride upon the heights of the earth. I will feed you with the heritage of your ancestor Jacob for the mouth of the Lord has spoken. So in this, some 700 years BC, and God had turned a blind eye to his people because they didn't take him seriously. They just went about their own way and actually were pursuing wickedness and then wondering when they prayed that God didn't show up. This is an important thing for us to understand because you know what? We're not that much different today some 2,700 years later. They went about their own way. They didn't treat God with any kind of honor or delight, and they were caught up in their own affairs. Look at our schedules. We fill our schedules so full of our own affairs and our own pursuits that we leave so little time for God. And so the first thing that God wants, you can see with this, is he wants to spend time. He says, you know what, even just spend some time with me. Test me in it, and I'm going to pour out some blessings on you. I'm going to vindicate the, you against those who have accused you or done you wrong. I'm going to have your back, and I'm going to bless you. This is a relationship that God really, he's, he's angry because he's jealous. He wants time in our schedule. And so as we're going to be learning a little bit more about this, this is really a message kind of for a believer. You know, this is that what we do to engage once we have believed. And if you have not believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, I pray that you would. 
and because we know that the Lord has died for you and for me, that he has covered our sins to let us go free so that we may be in heaven with God when we die. So as we trust in Jesus for our salvation, it's a free gift that we freely receive, then we're in. I mean, that's how it works. But we need to then further to have a productive life and an awesome life in Christ is to engage with God under his terms. And so his terms are this. He wants to spend time with you. He wants to be with you. Here in particular, they're talking about the, the holy day, the Sabbath, and, uh, and, but you know what God wants? I'll talk more about the Sabbath here in just a little bit. But this is important to know that God really, really wants to spend a dedicated time with us. And he also wants us to share his character. So all the things that were talked about here, God is a provider. Whenever we provide for somebody else, their felt needs or whatever else, that we may have the ability to do to relieve their pressure, whether or not uh, you're an employer, you know, we can look at God, can you please bless me to be able to make sure that I'm looking after our employees well enough. Uh, Lord, is, there's people in my family that might need some help. How can I do that? I have neighbors, Lord. What can I do to do that, help them? Now, sitting here in the suburbs, we don't have too many homeless people uh, walking down the street, and so we help ministries down in the city. And, but a lot of things that people need here, that are the felt needs in our society, are can we lend an empathetic ear to someone who is going through a difficult time? You know, many of the difficulties that uh, go on in a daily basis in the suburbs in a Western nation like ours are family issues, are, um, you know, children having a hard time with their parents and vice versa, uh, spouses uh, and those relationships breaking down. And we want to make sure that we can help with prayer and with encouragement and with training to help that that's what we can dispense to help people uh, to do well. And, but then, of course, if we do see somebody who is in need and we have physical goods to help them, then we do it. We do so as a church, but then we also need to do so in our own, uh, in our own daily walk, too. And so as we move forward from this, please note that the first thing that you should have gotten out of Isaiah 58 is, man, he wants to spend time with you. And as referenced in Proverbs chapter 3, verses 4 and 5, he also wants to lead us. God wants to lead us, and he's going to lead us in a particular way that is in line with his will, his character, his morals. And so this is important for us to find out. This is why one of the good things about studying scripture is that we can find his will. And when we find his will, then we can find our purpose in that will. First, it's the relationship. Second, it's now how can we be a part of something good? But we also need to realize that there's times that the giver needs to be given to. So I want to take a pause here for a second and talk to you about how to pray for yourself and how to go get help when you need it. It's one thing for people to keep telling you, here, do stuff after God's own will. But sometimes there might be people on the other side of this camera that are broken, that have gone through a lot of difficulties and don't have anything left to give. And for that, I encourage you, you know what, that's the great thing about Christian living is that it is reciprocal. God is the one, the only one, who doesn't get tired out and burnt out. But for us, there may be a time for you to step back, a time for you to rest. This is what talking about the Sabbath. The Sabbath is a command of God for us to be able to take back and spend time with him. Now, we understand in the New Testament, according to Colossians 2.17, that Jesus Christ is our Sabbath. You can look that up to read that a little more fully. And, but ultimately, we don't just kind of treat it just like as a day, but as a lifestyle of spending time with Jesus. He is the only one that can heal. He is the only one that can restore you. And he's the one that can inspire others to bless you as well as his own Holy Spirit to do so. So I want to encourage you. If, uh, if you feel that you are broken, that you've got nothing left to give, surround yourselves with other Christians to pray with you and to help you. And so as we move from there, we got to let God lead us. He is the one who is doing the work. It is his history. It's his earth. It's his creation. Even our bodies belong to him. So we must take his lead if we're going to encounter him. And the greatest part is, is that he cares for us. So we can cast all our cares uh, and anxieties upon him for he cares for us. And still always operates under the principle, as Jesus taught, is that he who is faithful with little will be given much. This is a very simple but accurate description of what God does when we engage in encounter with him. He gives us things that we can do that are within our time frame and in our abilities, and we should go do them. Some people want to be able to fast forward some of that, but you know what? God says, be faithful with little, and he will give you much. The blessing will come, the increase will come, but it is conditional upon us proving faithful in little things. I wonder which disciple it was that took that cup of wine to the master. Was it someone like Peter? It was at his first step in faith. Uh, and then let, yet later was the one who was able to walk on water and preach at Pentecost. Uh, you never know where the little things start and where they will lead to. So I want to encourage you. You may be looking off into the future for what God might have for you years down the road, 
but I want, this is a good time for us to then get introspective, for us to look at our own life and see, what has God given me that I haven't fully dealt with yet? Whether that's a moral issue he wants me to invest time in and prayer in to overcome, whether that be a particular ministry that he has entrusted to us, that he wants us to accomplish that. Maybe it's just a, a simple obedience of he wanted you to call one of your friends to encourage them and you just haven't done that yet. Again, it's not penalization, it is a faithfulness. In the same way that people get promoted throughout life as they excel and gain in wisdom in their profession, uh, is the same way that our Heavenly Father can do that in a perfect way, whereas things are often flawed here on the earth, that when we prove faithful with the little things, He will give us our next assignment. And if we rock that one out well, then He'll give us even more. And so the way up is the way down. Let's look down at the little things and then God will elevate us in due time. Uh, point two, it's a healing relationship that God is going to be on. We're one that he can come and be physically present to bless. You know, it's interesting to see of like what the things that God can do and the things that he has done in scripture are supposed to be an encouragement to us that anything is possible with God. Even though, as I said at the beginning, you are experiencing miracles that you know not of. Uh, but as we engage and encounter with God, we will find those out and then see even more. I'd like to point out a few things, is that sometimes we may get stuck in this world thinking if we have not engaged with God, we wonder where he is, and we don't think that he can uh, help our situation. But the fact of the matter is, the things that we had learned in Isaiah 58 are not only that should we uh, have a relationship with God, look after other people because we're going to be in community with God, we should be in good community with others, and helping those with their felt needs is important. But then next, what does it say? God's end of the deal, he's going to vindicate you. Do you need vindicating in any area of your life? Has someone cut you down or wronged you and you need to be vindicated? It says that he will go out, he actually describes himself as a name. The vindicator is really what that means. Uh, that's pretty cool. I would, you know, when you want someone to go vindicate you, you're not going to get anybody better than God to do that. And he says, and while he does that, he's going to have your rear guard. There are many things that have happened in life where uh, difficulty has even come my way. And I have seen sometimes it's taken a long time, sometimes it's taken a short time, where God has vindicated those who humble themselves before the Lord. I encourage you to, to engage with God because that is an incredible experience to know that when you have been mistreated, when you have been uh, hurt and down, and you forgive that person and put it into God's hands, then He is the one who will vindicate. Wow. And usually the purpose of the vindication is to give God's uh, blessing back out to the world, not to make a, uh, a display out of somebody else. So when the vindica vindication comes, praise the Lord and elevate your mighty God when that happens. And now there's some other words I'm going to take that are going to come flying from all over Scripture to help you understand what God can do in your life. Is not only can God vindicate you, that's one thing, and then your status still kind of remains. But, you know, God can restore, He can redeem, He redeems our soul, but He can redeem a lost relationship, He can redeem a job, He can redeem a school, He can redeem a friendship. So not only can He, uh, you know, vindicate you and bless you, He can also take back what was stolen and bring it to you. He can restore, He can recreate, He can do something new with our difficulties in our past and he can press the fast forward button. There might have been things that have been taken from you or done to you that make you feel that you are not where you should be in life. Well, if you focus on the relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ and you engage with him and encounter him, he can restore the days and restore what was lost and even give more on the other side of that. Again, don't go chasing after God just because we get stuff, but chase after God, but knowing that he is a provider. He loves to give us things and he can redeem the days. He can make it as if it never happened on this side of heaven as well as in eternity for heaven as well. But I do need to highlight today that the blessing of the Holy Spirit is for here and now and that we can have this action happen to us now. And the key to get there is through engaging with God, taking a time out to, to work on that relationship, and then to be faithful in that relationship, and then he'll just keep pouring out the blessing. There's a few times he even tempts people throughout Scripture, including in Malachi and other places. Tempt me in this, he says. You know, lean into this relationship, lean into faithfulness, and just watch what I will do. And so I want to encourage you to, if we want to see God redeem the days, to rebuild what was broken in your life, uh, to see what we can do in the future and to see that, you know what, where I thought I was behind, God can make me to pull ahead, then let's engage with the Lord Jesus Christ through this wonderful relationship that is the best part of Christianity is being restored to our God. And then to give you some scriptural reference points here, I'm just going to list off a number of scriptures that you can take a screenshot on the screen here or just pull out your Bible and start going through them. Uh, it's good to go through these topics throughout the entire Bible. And so I'm going to give you a flurry of them here 
right now. And it will bless you if you do take a minute and open and read those. So we learn of the Holy Spirit's blessing on us in this church age in Acts 2, 38, that we can encounter God as in Hebrews 4, 16, that God is a provider, Philippians 4, 19, that God is a rebuilder, redeemer, restorer, recreator. He makes all things new, Revelation 21, verses 3 to 5. And then next, that where we can uh, press fast forward, get God to press fast forward, and that he can be present to bless, as seen in 2 Thessalonians 2.16, Romans 5.17, and that there's an amazing joy in the Lord in this relationship all throughout Psalms, but in particular, Psalm 16, verse 11. So all of what we've shared so far today is an encouragement to help you to grow in your faith. It's always an encouragement and inspiration that I aim for, never to guilt or to shame anybody for not having done whatever in the past. God has given us a new day. He forgives continually, and so we should do the same. And then he keeps asking us to come into this relationship uh, ever deeper. We could be pursuing God with all we are for the rest of our lives and still not barely wade into the ocean that is his presence. And so let's tap into that stream now. Let us take dedicated time as God so wants us to, to move in. So what do we do about this? How do we go about it? Well, of course, taking time, as we said, taking time to spend with the Lord, to understand his statutes and his will, and to be faithful with the little things that he's given us are uh, some key ones. But here are a few more. As in 2 Corinthians 13, 5, we should test ourselves And to wonder, you get introspective saying, test yourself to wonder, why don't I want to lean in more to God? Have I prayed and he's not answered and that has made me upset? It has caused strife in my life because I have prayed before, I have tried before, but I have failed in that endeavor or God has failed me, you might think. I want to encourage you that everybody goes through a period of that in their life. I don't know a single person, pastor or otherwise, hasn't felt pretty lonely from a God relationship point of view. But I want to encourage you that's no time to pull away. Doubts are something you work through. Everybody has doubts, but doubts, doubt is the opposite of faith. And so we need to then try again. We need to engage again through faith. And again, it's okay to have doubts, but just don't live there. Faith is the opposite. Faith is the antidote to doubt. And another good reason to test ourselves is sometimes, you know, in this materialistic culture, we can be much like the the culture in Isaiah 58, which was they just did their own thing. And, uh, you know, really they ended up having an idolatry of themselves where they worshiped their own pleasure. Now, it is a wonderful thing to be able to enjoy the creation that God has given it given us, but we should do so in the way that he has prescribed us to live it. Nobody knows how to better live this life on this earth than him. He's the one that made it. He made us. Who could possibly know what is best for us other than him? And so I want to encourage you with that, that sometimes we can put ourselves uh, on the altar and worship ourselves by leaving no time for anybody else but ourselves. So when we take a stop and a look and test our faith to see, wow, have I really replaced God in my life with stuff, with things? Um, again, that's to inspire us to then engage back with God. Another good thing of taking account to where we are, as found in 2 Timothy 1, is for us to uh, get healed ourselves, to look in and see what is going on in our life that we might need healing. And this leads off to a little mini section here on prayer. I've seen it across the board, at least here in this nation, of what happens when people pray. Well, when you pray, you're dedicating time to be in that relationship with God. And what happens is your soul relaxes, your mind, your body, your spirit relaxes. And that's a good thing for sure, but usually what ends up happening is the to-do list that you have, which is really long, there's a lot of clutter that we have jammed inside our brains. And when we relax to focus on God, that seems to then come into prominence in a negative way. You think of, oh, I gotta go get groceries. You think of, oh, I gotta go get that paint can and do this, or whatever it is that, you know what it is when you pray that you can't seem to break through in prayer because your to-do list is just so long and your head is full of clutter and it distracts you so easily. I encourage you that when you go to pray that you would take a pen and paper. And you know what, as that comes to mind, just write that stuff down so that you know that you don't have to remember in that moment. And let the clutter just disappear. Sometimes I've known people that that can take up to a half an hour just to deal with the clutter in their mind. Sometimes it's faster. Well, then typically what happens after that is once the clutter's free, usually the next thing is is our feelings of guilt or remorse of things that we didn't do. Now, the Holy Spirit is a convictor, not convictor like a judge convicts somebody, but someone that brings a conviction that things should change. And so to enter into a relationship with God means we are entering into holiness. And if God is holy, he wants to make us in the likeness of his son. So once the clutter is dealt with, I find that people often have kind of a shrinking feeling of the things that they should have done right but didn't. Um, oftentimes that can be an attack from the enemy to just try to throw you off from praying. Other times it could be the sweet 
voice of the Holy Spirit helping us say, look, you really do need to address this. You do need to work on this, and you need to ask for forgiveness, and you need to include me in this so that I can help take this from you, and to know that God is a forgiving God. And then once people break through uh, that conviction, then that is where a relationship often just glows and beams, and people can spend numerous, uh, even hours, in the presence of God in that prayer time. And so that is a common thing of what happens when people pray. I want to encourage you to do that, to take stock of our own lives, to declutter our minds, to ask forgiveness for what we have done wrong, get healed in our hearts, and then spend time with the most interesting being that has ever existed. And another thing that we can do beyond that, what I just taught and what I taught earlier of the felt needs of others around you, that we have the resources to help, that we should, there is also something that we need to give quite a bit of, and that's forgiveness. Scripture teaches us very clearly that if we do not forgive, like how can we not forgive when we have been forgiven so much? There are plenty of teachings and parables and examples given throughout Scripture that we really need to forgive. Forgiveness is a way for you to break the chains that are hanging you down. And now forgiveness does not mean accepting that person's behavior as right that may have wronged you. No, forgiveness means that you hold no charge against them. You need to gain wisdom to try to protect yourself from that happening again. Not a paranoia, not in uh, retribution to that person, but you forgive, but then you only give of yourself again in a way that is healthy. Remember how I said that if God treats us uh, and he who is faithful little will be given much, so that works with trust with relationships. If someone has proven that they're incapable of a trust, you forgive them, but you may not give them that trust back again until they know they can handle it. And that is the, the appropriate response we should give. So forgive. Whoever you uh, are uh, harboring anything bitter against, that can also be a block because we learn very clearly that, that God does not live in unforgiveness and he really wants us to forgive because he has outforgiven us and we need to be like him. Here's a test that I like to give to help us know, do we actually forgive somebody? And forgiving them to the uttermost. How do you know if you've forgiven somebody to the uttermost? Well, take the person who you have the most bitterness towards. Now imagine that when they die, they go to heaven. Picture them there. How did that make you feel? I hope that it made you feel good because that would mean that they would have to come to Christ, that they would have to follow him, and that God would change them and change them forevermore in heaven. We never want to tell people to go to hell, no matter how mad they are or how bad they've been to us because that means Satan wins one more soul and God does not want that. So to forgive in such a manner, to be like, God, I've been hurt so bad by this person, but I forgive them so much, and God, please give me the strength to help me if I can't. To God, if I didn't think positively of them in heaven, God, please work on my heart to help to forgive to that level so that I can be free from the pain. Because I encourage you this, and, and this is absolutely true, if you had uh, anything other than a positive response to that, again, this is inspirational, that means that there's a chain around your neck holding you down. You have so much more freedom waiting, and forgiveness is the key to unlock that chain to get your freedom. Trust God with the person who has harmed you. He is your vindicator, not you. Let it go. Set healthy boundaries um, as you move into your relationships into the future. And then going off on that, as much as we talked about people being in heaven, we too will go to heaven one day. We have an incredible inheritance by being adopted in uh, to the family of God, as we learn in John chapter 1 that because of what he has done on the cross, it's not only saved us, it has not only given us a relationship here now on the earth and forever in heaven, it also comes with an inheritance, meaning the stuff that is God's is ours. How incredible is that? Have you ever thought that you had access to, um, as an heir, uh, to the Father in heaven? And, and it's something that we can access now, not fully, we will have it fully in heaven, but we will have it in part now. Could you imagine if you found out that uh, you were going to have an inheritance from somebody who was very wealthy, for example, and they said, well, you can have access to it now. It's not all yours right now, but you can have access to it. Wouldn't it be great if you could go by and uh, borrow the guy's motorcycle for a bit or whatever else and then just go and have a big time? I want to encourage you to realize that, that by being part of the Christian faith, being part of the Christian relationship with Jesus Christ via the Holy Spirit, that we have an inheritance to look forward to here and forevermore. And so as we conclude this message here today, I pray that God would give you the forbearance to be able to forgive those who have crushed you, that you can dedicate time in the relationship with God because he wants to be with you and he wants to bless you. 
and he wants you to forgive because you know what? If they're still breathing, God wants them saved too. So let's work on our forgiveness. Let's work on doing what we can do today. Let's work on the partnerships that we can do more tomorrow and to see what God might do with a ragtag few people here at Regal Heights Church. If you haven't joined our family yet, I can't wait to meet you. Come on in. Sunday is 10 o'clock or give the office a call and we'll arrange a time to meet up. Thank you for tuning in. God bless you. Have a great day. Thank you.